Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, you know, they say beware of the Ides of March in South Asia, in modern South Asia, especially in Pakistan at our end. The, just after the Ides of March seem, seem to be a very important moment in the calendar. So today is the 25th of March, of course. And this is the day when in 1971, the Pakistani army began a military operation which led to perhaps one of the greatest genocides in the history of South Asia in East, what used to be East Pakistan and is today Bangladesh. So I wanted to start by marking that for anybody who thought historically and still had some sense that the, the two nation theory, supposedly on which the basis of which Pakistan was created made any sense historically. That was over in 1971. The other date which we just passed was the 23rd of March. That's the day on which Pakistan celebrates the first iteration of the demand for Pakistan in the year 1940. And I'll mention that a little bit. And the interesting thing about that is that the document, which is called the Pakistan Resolution, both in India and in Pakistan, um, never mentions the word Pakistan. So we're talking about these very odd experiences in history. Well, on the one hand, the founding document, which says nothing about what it's supposed to found. And on the other hand, a genocide, a huge human catastrophe. Right? Actually, the theme of disaster and catastrophe has some overlap, but with uh, Benjamin Riley's own work, Dr. Benjamin Riley's own work, and I want to thank him for inviting me. He's written a book, Disaster in Human History. I also think a lot about disaster, but not about natural disasters, as um, Dr. Benjamin Riley does. I'd like to start, my, the title of my talk is Nation Statehood as Historical Exile. And historical, I mean, it's exactly, it's supposed to be ironic because, uh, precisely because we use, usually think of nation statehood as coming into history. Being a nation state is what, in the modern period, inaugurates you as a historical uh, actor. So with nation statehood, you come to inhabit history rather than be exiled from history. And I'll speak, that's what my paper is about, is how this comes about. I don't want to make it a general claim, although I would suggest that there are parallels in this regard um, with other cases as well. But in the case of Pakistan, allow me to begin. Historical rupture is not merely a postulate within historical epistemology and historiography. It is a historical experience. Right? So, Historians talk a lot about historical rupture, not so much about the experience of rupture, right? As if it's just a way of organizing their data rather than the experience that people actually undergo. It is a historical experience characteristic of modernity, the experience of historical catastrophe, and one that historiography has in fact often failed to perceive and so to represent by virtue of teleological imperatives because they already know where they want to go categorical logics and evidentiary protocols that militate against the very legibility of catastrophic historical experience. Imperatives, logics, and protocols that are constitutive of history as a discipline. One of the most dramatic discoveries of the recent historiography of Pakistan, a discovery that has yet far from exhausted its potential historical legibility. It's, you can't always see what's right in front of your eyes often. Right? So legibility, are we able to read this experience? A discovery that has yet far from exhausted its potential his historical legibility has been the sheer historical contingency of the country's emergence. We like to think of ourselves, especially when it comes to national histories, as being agents. Right? So you self-consciously bring about events and the realization of events. So there is a necessity in history. You like to think of it as being a necessary development. I'm saying quite the contrary. It's mostly about contingency, the opposite of necessity. 
In the fullness of its legibility, the historical experience of this massive contingency calls for unwavering attention to the following historical fact. That's the main fact that I'm claiming we need to pay attention to in all the magnitude of its abyssal violence. At the very moment of its historical emergence, Pakistan was a country that was not meant to have been, not meant to have been. And I'm constantly gesturing at this, what should one call it, counterfactual logics that inhabit history, right? That which did not happen or that which was meant to happen but had another meaning altogether, all kinds of counterfactual logics inhabit history and we don't think about those as much as we do about that which is actually the case. Right? The inaugural historiographical intervention in this regard was Aisha Jalal's 1985 monograph, The Soul Spokesman, Jinnah, the Muslim League and the Demand for Pakistan, which showed that at the level of high politics, the demand for Pakistan was in fact driven by the search for a political settlement that would free the Muslims of India from the straitjacket of their minority status within the Indian Union, within the Indian Union, putting them on par with the majority. At most, Pakistan was a bargaining counter in negotiations over the constitutional shape of the post-colonial Indian Union that was on the historical horizon of anti-colonial nationalism. We have to keep in mind that at this moment, right, nobody had any idea or any historical experience of what a nation state is, right? Or because there had never been any nation states. So people were trying to figure out, well, once we become free, and all kinds of people, right? Everybody was trying to figure out, once we become free, what are we going to be? That was the essential anti-colonial nationalist question. What is free India, right, going to be? What is freedom? At most, Pakistan was a bargaining counter in negotiations over the constitutional shape of the post-colonial Indian Union that was on the historical horizon of anti-colonial nationalism. The reality it named was not that of a territorial nation state, but the Muslim share in a constitutional vision of binational or multinational sovereignty for the people of India. It's difficult for us, given the way the international order is organized, right, to imagine binational sovereignty. The moment we think of sovereignty, we think of one nation, right? Of binational sovereignty for the people of India. Remarkable too in this regard is the temporality of the experience, right? A key measure of historical significance. The extreme abbreviation of the temporal frame in which the politics of decolonization and partition unfolded, right? Even if we are to accept that 1940, March 23, 1940, is when the demand for Pakistan, right, uh, was articulated. Even if we did do accept that, I don't accept it, and I'll tell you why, right? Even then, it's merely seven years. What is seven years? I mean, we're talking about a truly world historical event. I, for, for those of you who don't know much about the partition, it's possibly the largest, apart from a, about possibly a million people dying in the event, it's possibly also the largest migration in human history. Benjamin will probably be able to uh, tell me whether this is true or not, but between 12 and 16 million people, right, um, being a transfer of population that nobody had anticipated, right? So, so a world historical event, which takes seven years, I mean, uh, seven years, uh, for me, I know uh, many, most people in the audience are younger, much younger than me, but the experience of years, you will realize only within 15 years or so, right? It just flies by as you grow older, right? It's, it's no time at all. If I think back to 2005, it's really like yesterday for me, right? So the extreme brevity in which this politics unfolded. Thus, for example, not only was Pakistan never thematized, never even enunciated in what both Indian and Pakistani national historiographies commemorate, as the high political discursive inauguration of the demand for Pakistan, the so-called Pakistan Resolution of 1940, but famously as late as April 1943, right? So we are saying over a year after, a mere four years before the fateful moment of formal decolonization and or three years after, and partition, Jinnah still avowed in a speech to the All India Muslim League, that, and I'm quoting Jinnah here, 
Pakistan is a word that is really foisted upon us by some section of the Hindu press. Close quote. Foisted upon us, right? Pakistan is a word that is really foisted upon us by some section of the Hindu press, an avowal, obviously, which leaves itself remarkably open to be read as a disavowal of the very idea of Pakistan. Indeed, right to the end, or rather, taking a better measure of the force of this historical fact, right to the beginning, the League continued to protest against Hindustan adopting the title Union of India. Since the latter was to be binationally constituted by Pakistan and Hindustan together, a historical fact all but illegible to our mononational teleological historical vision. So right to the end, they kept saying, you cannot call what we call today India, the Indian Union. Hindustan and Pakistan together constitute the Indian Union. How do you make sense of that? Right? Nor, of course, do these brief examples exhaust the extensive evidentiary basis for the claim of massive contingency. At the popular level itself, it has become clear that even for those who were committed to the idea of Pakistan, within the brief temporal frame, on the very cusp, or rather in the very moment of decolonization, its meaning was opaque, and the actual experience of its realization was utterly unexpected, an experience of profound historical rupture that those recounting the event have called Inkalab, revolution, a name far more appropriate to the traumatic violence of the event than our own bloodless nomenclature of decolonization, independence, or indeed partition, which retains its administrative and clinical resonance even in this context. Thus, it is not surprising that the most significant recent monograph on the partition, Wazira Zamindar's The Long Partition and the Making of Modern South Asia, has as its temporal frame the years 1947 to 1965. So 20, 20 years, almost 20 years after what we usually call partition, effectively challenging and pushing forward after formal decolonization and partition, the standard periodization of the event, and opening up for our scrutiny the liminal historical space, liminal, that is between, right, neither this nor that, the liminal historical space between the career of anti-colonial nationalism and the crystallization of modern nation states, right? So formal decolonization happens on 14th August, 15th August, 1947, right? Wazira Zamindar says that you have to wait until 1965 before you can actually recognize anything that would resemble what we today call India and Pakistan. Right? The fact of sheer historical contingency, the experience of catastrophic historical rupture, thus yield a new historical period. You know, how we periodize something is absolutely essential to what we are able to see. Right? A, a, a historical period is key the identification of a historical period is key to being able to see the data. This is something we don't think often enough about, right? There's a lot of stuff that you'll simply miss if you don't have the category to see it, right? I mean, our empiricism, our kind of almost natural empiricism at this point, uh, doesn't allow us to understand this about our own cognitive abilities. You can't see things if you don't have some kind of concept to be able to see it. Right? That's not all it's about, but that's a very important part. What does it mean to inherit such a 